Thank you so much. Good evening, and, and thank you, Francis, for that very kind introduction. And what a wonderful privilege it is to be here among so many distinguished guests, including so many of my dear friends. And I'm really very sorry that my colleague and friend, Dr. Kazmikia Corbett, could not join us in person this evening. However, I join Kizzy in in expressing to you my very deepest appreciation to the Fulbright Association for this extraordinary honor, and I mean that very sincerely. Looking at the list that we saw on the screen, I am thoroughly humbled to be in the company of so many outstanding individuals who have previously received this award, including last year's recipient, my dear friend Bono. Now, in listening, some of you were here then, in listening to his heartfelt acceptance remarks, I was struck by the fact that although he is an Irishman, he spoke so incisively and movingly about what a great country America is and about what American leadership over the years has meant to him and to other countries. In this regard, then, as an American and as a scientist and public health official who has recently stepped down from official duties, I am choosing this evening to reflect briefly on my perspective on the experience of our country over the past three and one quarter years with the globally devastating COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the theme of the Fulbright Prize is global understanding. And so in the context of the global pandemic of COVID, our global understanding has been inexorably linked to experiences that we shared with the rest of the world, for there are few experiences more global than the universal nature of a historic global pandemic. And so in the next few minutes, I want to speak briefly about lessons learned from our experiences during this global pandemic, as well as what I believe are worrisome trends in our society that could make contending with the inevitable next global pandemic even more challenging. America's COVID-19 pandemic saga has been a battle fought on two independent but overlapping fronts, the scientific preparedness and response and the public health preparedness and response. The first lesson I speak of is the critical importance of sustained investments in biomedical research. For the 38 years during which I served as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, my critical mission was to sustain a robust investment in basic and clinical research to better understand how microbes emerge persist and are capable of causing human suffering and death on a domestic and an international scale. NIAID's decades-long investment in research on coronaviruses prior to 2020, as you heard from Kizzy, paid off handsomely in our scientific response to COVID. And Kizzy's work that she described is a striking example of that, as is the clinical work of one of my guests tonight, Cliff Lane, and the extraordinary partnership of Francis Collins during that critical period of time. And I think we should recognize both of those. <laughs> That effort enabled the scientific and clinical research community to accomplish something 
that would have been unimaginable, as you've heard, just a decade ago, as described by Francis, to go from having the sequence of a new virus on January 20th, 2020, and 11 months later, to have more than one vaccine that has proven to be safe and highly effective in clinical trials involving tens of thousands of volunteers going into the arms of several millions of Americans and billions of people throughout the world. The Commonwealth Fund recently estimated that in the United States alone, from December 2020 through November 2022, the vaccine program averted more than 3 million deaths, 18 million hospitalizations, and saved more than $1 trillion in healthcare costs. The The combination of Operation Warp Speed, initiated during the previous administration to make available hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine, together with the extraordinary accomplishment of ensuring the expeditious distribution of the vaccine into the arms of people, an effort led by Jeff Zients, who is here with us tonight. When Jeff was the coordinator of President Biden's Saved Millions of Lives. And so, as the COVID pandemic fades in our memories, let us not forget the importance of sustained investment in biomedical research. That is the good news. There is, however, some rather sobering news. For at the same time, we must be mindful that for a variety of reasons, aspects of the public health response to the pandemic in the United States have not been as successful as they could have been. One reason among several for this is that unfortunately, over the course of the pandemic, the anti-science element has been emerging in certain segments of our society, not just in the United States, but worldwide. In our country, unfortunately, it is particularly pronounced, and it threatens the routine aspects of public health as well, including the vital importance of childhood immunizations that are unrelated to COVID. The rise of this anti-science sentiment worries me greatly because it leads to the denigration of scientific facts, evidence, and data. The ease with which flagrant untruths become accepted and widely disseminated largely through social media is the antithesis of the essence of science which is to uncover truths. The normalization and acceptance of untruths by a disturbing proportion of our population hinders our efforts to unify the understanding of and adherence to up-to-date evidence-based public health guidance, especially during a pandemic. And this leads to another painful lesson that I do hope we heed. The United States, the richest country in the world, has endured more than 1.13 million COVID deaths. It is deeply disturbing that our per capita death rate is as bad or worse than that of many low and middle income countries. It is my opinion, and I believe that it is at least partially true, that one of the complex reasons why this has occurred is because of the to profound divisiveness in our country that has clouded a coherent public health response. 
Now, it is obvious that we live in a very diverse country, geographically, culturally, economically, religiously, and with regard to political ideology. Our diversity has contributed substantially to why we are a great country. For those of you who were here last year, recall Bono's acceptance speech for the Fulbright Prize in which, as a non-American, he praised us for our diversity. The diversity in our political ideologies, whether one is progressive, liberal, center-left, straight-on center, center-right, conservative, or far-right, has historically contributed to our having a balanced and healthy society as long as we respect our differences. However, events over the past few years have been greatly disturbing. I speak only from the perspective of a scientist and a public health official whose professional life over the past three years has been largely consumed by COVID pandemic. We cannot let diversity and healthy differences in ideology deteriorate into divisiveness, especially amid a pandemic, because divisiveness is the enemy of public health. And in this pandemic of historic proportions, divisiveness, particularly in the lack of acceptance of life-saving vaccines, has sadly cost thousands of lives that should not have been lost. We must find ways to repair and prevent divisiveness that arises from our ideological differences. In a pandemic, we must always keep the focus of our efforts directed against the common enemy, the virus, and not each other. Now, I have been privileged many times to experience firsthand how when we in the United States were faced with enormous challenges, including in the arena of public health, we were much more successful when we worked together and respected each other's differences. This has proven true time and again. And in my own career, beginning with the HIV AIDS pandemic in the 1980s, when we learned from the mostly gay activist community who questioned and pushed back on us on how to do a better job in responding to this terrible plague. It is noteworthy that Peter Staley, who was one of the leaders of the AIDS activist movement decades ago, is now my guest here tonight at our table. But also, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and the anthrax attacks that followed, we came together as a nation and we put our differences aside. We have not done this very well with COVID. Hopefully, we will do better with future pandemics. So let us not let corporate memory fade and in our preparedness for the inevitable next pandemic, let us be mindful of the science that in essence rescued us and the divisiveness, disinformation, politicization, and normalizations of truth that has impeded us. This is the important lesson. Now, although I have been highlighting challenges and lessons learned on the domestic front, in the spirit of the Fulbright theme of international understanding, I want to end my remarks on a note of America at its best on the international scene. In 2002, as you heard from Francis, President George W. Bush gave me the opportunity to partner with him and serve as an architect of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR. He commissioned me to go to Africa and to come back with a plan to address 
a very specific and disturbing issue. Literally, millions of people in the developing world, particularly in southern Africa, were dying of HIV AIDS, which was eminently manageable with appropriate antiviral drugs. These drugs were literally saving the lives of persons with HIV in the United States and other developed countries who had access to these life-saving drugs. President Bush told me and others that the United States, as a rich country, has a moral responsibility to ensure that to the extent possible that people do not die avoidable deaths from treatable and preventable diseases such as HIV, AIDS, because of where they were born. PEPFAR rolled out in 2003. It was an enormous investment measured in billions of dollars on the part of the American public of which we should be proud, showing what international engagement and the leadership of the United States president can do. Bono also spoke about this, about how America, when it takes a leadership role, can show itself as a truly great nation. This year, on the 20th anniversary, PEPFAR, a bipartisan a supported initiative, has been estimated to have saved an estimated 25 million lives. That is the epitome of international understanding. And so finally, looking ahead to my own future goals, I am committed to continuing to contribute however and wherever I can be most effective to support activities that in the spirit of William Fulbright enhance the health and well-being of all people in the United States and around the globe. Thank you very much.